In a previous lecture, we learned how to calculate degree of relatedness between individuals in a family. Now to do that, we need a pedigree. We need to understand the relationships between individuals. Sometimes we can do that. Sometimes we do that in a laboratory. Sometimes we can do that through genetic testing or through careful observation of wild populations. But it serves as a foundation, and it serves as a conceptual framework for this concept we're going to talk about next. Now, for this concept, I'm not going to actually have you calculate it out. The two other components of this equation are actually very difficult and tricky to calculate out. Degree of relatedness you can do if you have a pedigree, and you should be able to do that. But these two other uh, coefficients here, um, b, which is the degree of benefit, and C, which is the cost, are much harder to calculate. So we're going to use this equation more as a conceptual framework for understanding the origin of something that we call kinship selection. Okay, <clears throat> And kinship selection was an early explanation for a situation in which altruism, altruism is a beneficial trait. And so when it occurs by chance, when there's a mutation and individuals tend to help their close relatives, that in many situations is actually a very good thing. And we can see elements of this that have uh, occurred in the human species also. It's complicated and might go just uh, beyond simple uh, helping out a close relative, but certainly there are elements of this in the human species also. But there are many other species. For instance, this is an image of a prairie dog exhibiting a behavior that is a altruistic behavior. When a predator is around, a rattlesnake or a black-footed ferret or a hawk, Many prairie dogs will risk their own life to warn the prairie dogs around them. They get up and they make this noise. It sounds like a bark, which is why they're called prairie dogs, because the sound is a little bit like a dog barking when they're actually rodents. But anyway, it will warn its relatives, and it puts its own life at risk. It's exposed to higher levels of predation by warning everyone else. But it will bark, make these noises, and then try to escape itself. Now, that's a very interesting behavior because it would seem to be something that would put its own life at risk, it's altruistic, and so we would, per, we would maybe, if we didn't understand everything around it, expect that this behavior should never be selected for and should, if it ever pops up in a population, be immediately or quickly removed by natural selection. And it turns out that the key to understanding this was a little bit of information that prairie dogs will do this much more frequently when they are near their very close relatives. If all of their close relatives are far away, or if you put them in a new environment where there aren't many close relatives, then they will show dramatic drops in their willingness to warn those around them. And so here is the equation. So R is the degree of relatedness. B is the benefit that is received by your close relatives. So we're going to time the degree of relatedness by that benefit. C is the cost to the individual that is exhibiting the um, altruistic behavior. And so this is the classical way that this equation is drawn, is drawn. But of course, if you remember your math, you could also do it this way. If RB is greater than C, then altruism will be selected for. So this is the equation to figure out when altruism is going to be a adaptive advantage, when natural selection will keep altruistic behaviors in the population. So if the degree of relatedness times the benefit to your relatives minus the cost is greater than zero, or maybe more simply put, if the degree of relatedness times the benefit is greater than the cost overall, then it will be selected for by natural selection. And so remember, we need to do inclusive fitness. And so this benefit includes not only what your relatives are getting, but how helping your relatives might also, in a way, be helping you. Because if you're in a group and you rely on that group, and there are even some more subtle things going on here. So for instance, there's a good chance that your close relatives carry your same genes. So in a way, sorry, your same alleles is a better way to put that. So in a way, by helping close relatives, you're kind of helping yourselves because they are part you. And so those are all the complicated things that need to be uh, estimated and figured out when we're looking at this. Okay. So again, just know this equation, know it conceptually. I'm not going to actually make you calculate it out or figure it out because that's a very tricky thing to do because getting numbers for benefit and numbers for cost can be hard to do. 
And in extreme situations, when the benefit is very, very high, we can end up with eusocial systems. And these are images of species that are eusocial. So let's define sociality. I kind of took it for granted that you knew what a social system was. And then let's define eusociality. So sociality, in a very simplistic form, is any group where there is some sort of cooperative behavior between individuals. So a wolf pack is a social system. A pod of dolphins is a social system. And of course, humans have very complex social systems where we interact and we help each other. And there's going to be some conflict in those social systems. But they hang together, they, they are cohesive and are long-term a benefit to the organisms if the benefits you get from those social interactions outweigh the costs and the detriments of being a part of that social system. And so those social systems tend to persist when they are overall beneficial. And so eusociality occurs when those social systems go to such an extreme degree that there is division of biological roles within the society. And what I mean by that is the easiest way to think about it is there are some individuals that reproduce. And so historically in an evolutionary trade-off, some individuals gave up all or most of their chances at reproduction to help out the colony. And usually they're called colonies, but they can have other names also like hives. Um, so honeybees are an example of a used social system. The female is the only female, sorry, the queen is the only female who can reproduce. And then there are male drones, and they are the only reproductive uh, males in that system. Same thing in termites. There's a queen who does all the reproducing. And then sometimes there are multiple other groups, castes, they're called, C-A-S-T-E. There might be a worker caste, there might be a soldier caste, and sometimes there are even more than that. But they have very defined specific roles in that society. Now there's only one known eusocial mammal and that is pictured here in the upper right and it's the naked mole rat. If you're a Kim Possible fan you might be familiar with them or maybe you've learned about them in another biological biology class. But the naked mole rat is the only known eusocial mammal. So it's not a very easy thing to evolve in mammals but it's evolved many many times in arthropods. So we have examples in the honeybees here, the termites. On the lower left, we have crustaceans, right? Some shrimp have done it. These are thrips, another type of insect, and some beetles. So we see it over and over again in the arthropods. They seem to be predisposed towards eusociality. And in reality, if we look at it, amongst the hymenoptera, which are the ants, bees, and wasps, that group, there are multiple, multiple examples of eusociality. And so that led people to wonder, why is it so common among the ants, bees, and wasps. And once they understood their mode of reproduction, we actually understood why their eusociality is so common in the ants, bees, and wasps. So we won't get into all the details, but it turns out by a trick of the way that they reproduce, that females are actually 75% related to one another. Uh, a sister to her brother is only 25% related. Okay, And so it depends on so even if you are full siblings, you are only 25% related to a full brother. It's kind of a weird quirk of the way that they reproduce, okay? So this means that if we go back to this equation, the degree of relatedness for sisters is higher than it is for most species. In most species, you're 50% related to your sister. But if you are a bee, then you are 75% related to your sister. And so what that means is there can be a higher cost, maybe even giving up all of your reproduction if it helps your sister reproduce, because she carries 75% of your alleles. So there can be lower benefit or higher cost, and this equation will still work out. And so because of the elevated degree of relatedness between sisters, it's very common for mutations that allow for altruistic behavior and eventually lead to altruism it's much more possible for those mutations to be kept. It's more likely that if an individual gives up some or all of their reproductive ability to help a relative, that will overall be a good thing, okay? So just know that that high degree of relatedness is predisposes the hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps to evolving eusociality. Now, there are other behaviors that can also explain altruism other than this kinship selection. So let's talk about one of them 
And then we're going to end this discussion by looking at and maybe reminding you, hopefully you learned about them, or at least most of them in other classes, but we're going to remind you about the types of ecological interactions that can occur between species. Okay. We also want to define this concept of an evolutionarily stable strategy. This is any strategy either between individuals in the same species or between two different species where there is basically a best case scenario, an ultimate strategy that works best. And so everyone is eventually going to end up at that best strategy because overall it works the best for the population and for the individuals. Now that's a little complicated, so let me give you an analogy. Imagine that there is a single best strategy that works in a sports venue. So let's say football. And we can see this to some extent, right? So most people have decided that within a certain range, it's going to be always best to punt on fourth down, right? So if you are, are way, way back in your own, uh, near your own end zone, end, end zone, it's almost always going to be good to post on fourth down, to punt on fourth down, because the costs of messing it up far outweigh any benefit if you get that, that first down. And so most teams have decided that they're always going to punt within a certain range. And, you know, and there might be some slight variations to that. So maybe there's not a single strategy, but sometimes there might be. There might be a, a situation where all the time everyone always does one thing. And this can occur in species. And let's look at a single example where an evolutionary stable strategy has led to a form of altruism. And this is also a form of something that we call group selection. So these are vampire bats. Vampire bats rest, roost in small groups. Here we've got about 20 to 25 individuals um, that are not necessarily closely related to one another. So they just form these loose social groups of roosts at night uh, or in the day. And at night they go out and they look for a meal. Now vampire bats rely solely on drinking blood for their uh, meals, for their food. Now they don't suck blood, but what they do is they bite a large mammal, usually, some of them will also target other organisms, but they bite a large mammal and then they lap up the blood and they have an anticoagulant in their saliva that allows the blood to flow freely while they're uh, licking the blood from uh, their victim. Now, where vampire bats live, they can't find a victim every single night. So they're not successful at feeding every night, but they basically need to eat just about every day. But if you do find a victim, you usually are able to get much, much more food than you really need for that one day. And so this strategy has evolved amongst the vampire bats where the individuals that find a prey item will drink as much blood as they possibly can hold and still fly. And then they will all go back to the roost at night. And the individuals that were successful that had a blood meal will regurgitate part of that blood meal to help individuals in their roost. Now, this is a bit of a mystery at first because they're not family members, so it's not really a kinship selection thing. But what people realized is that when we have populations divided up into these small groups, if there is a behavior that helps the group, that's going to provide more strength. And so they rely on one another for... Um, maintaining their body heat for uh, uh, roosting at night. And so if your individuals in your roost are healthy, that's going to be a good thing for you. And we can think about this. This group selection probably applied very strongly in early human history, where if you are helping individuals in your small uh, tribe, right, your small group, then that's probably going to help you because your tribe is going to be stronger. And overall, that's a benefit to you. So group selection, and this is when a large population is broken into small groups, can also reinforce and cause these seemingly altruistic behaviors. Okay, last thing, I just want to review this. This concept, or part of it at least, might be very familiar to you. We're going to begin to start talking about relationships between species also, and conflict between and cooperation sometimes between species. If we have two different species that are interacting with one another, there are six possible outcomes for those interactions. The first one is mutualism. In mutualism, species number one is benefited from the interaction, and so is species number two. So it, it benefits both partners in that interaction. Pollination is a very 
a classic example of this. The plant gets a distribution of its gametes, its pollen, and the pollinator gets some sort of a bribe. A, they either eat some of the pollen or the nectar that's provided for them, and so they get nutrition out of it. So that is a win-win situation. That's called mutualism. The second one is where one species benefits and the other is uh, negatively impacted. Now, most people think of this as parasitism, and that's true. Parasitism is one form, but predation is another form. And even herbivory, right, where a, a beetle will eat a plant, it benefits the plant uh, is damaged, and so it, it's a detrimental interaction for the plant. So more generally, these types of relationships are called antagonism. But parasitic, parasitic relationships, predator-prey relationships, and herbivore and the plants they're eating, those are all antagonistic relationships. Commensalism occurs when there is a benefit for one species, and the other species is not impacted much at all. So for instance, um, we do have some organisms that are not really true parasites, but that live on our body. You might have heard of um, uh, eyebrow mites. Most people have little tiny mites living in the follicles of their eyebrows. It's kind of gross. We think, ah, oh, I don't want that little creepy crawly living on me. But it is a uh, long-term relationship. It benefits the mites, and it really does not hurt us at all. Uh, there's very rarely a negative impact. In fact, for many, many, uh, long, long time, we didn't even know about these guys, okay? So they're there, but they don't hurt us, they don't help us, they don't hurt us, they're just there, okay? That is a commensal relationship. These last three you don't need to know as, as much. These are the ones that are really more important when we're looking at the evolution of behavior of, uh, between species. But we can also have a negative-negative impact. That's called competition. So for example, if lions and hyenas are living in the same area, they both do worse. If we remove the hyenas, the lions would do better. If we remove the lions, the hyenas would do better. So that's a competition react, uh, interaction. Amensalism is when there's a negative impact on one species and the other one is not impacted at all. And then neutralism is basically where there's no imp, uh, impact at all. They're living in the same environment, but they really don't have a plus or a minus on each other. But don't worry about those last two as much. But do please make sure you know mutualism, antagonism, and commensalism. And we'll be talking about examples of these and how they've impacted the evolution of two species in our coming discussions.